Okay, so, so today we're gonna, uh, so someone asked a question, which is a great question. What's the standard model and how does the tape boson fit into it? Um, so it's usually a topic that, that people are quite interested in. It's certainly not a topic that I'm an expert on, but uh, I'll give you my interpretation of, of what the standard model is. And I think it's kind of a fun thing that really is, you know, the standard model, because it works really, really well, um, it has things that, you know, 10 plus decimal places. And it's the standard model because it's the model of how all the particles in our universe that, we're, uh, that we know about, right, this little slice of matter uh, that, 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 that we actually understand as a regular matter, how it works. And so it basically make, is made up in the, the following three pieces. So this is really the standard model right here. So we have bosons, hadrons, and, and fermions. And so the idea is that, so for example, things like leptons, the electron, and the neutrino, we assume that these are indivisible particles in the sense that a lepton um, is not made up of anything else. And similarly, over on the left here, we have these gauge bosons well, that we'll talk about more. We've already talked a little bit about the photons today. We'll learn those bosons and eventually the Higgs. Um, and then there's hadrons. Hadrons make up the heavy stuff, basically. Uh, things like protons, neutrons, the constituents of, of atoms. And these things are, are subdivisible. So this is you know, kind of an interesting thing that initially um, it wasn't clear whether a proton was actually made up of smaller stuff. And so this is a long-standing uh, long question and then eventually it was solved. And now we know that, that protons, for example, are made up of two up quarks and a down quark. Um, and, and we'll learn more about that later on. And, and so I've, I've mentioned this before, but the, the kind of, the distinction anyways between these two lobes, the bosons and fermions, is basically integer or half integer spin. So bosons have 0, 1, 2, fermions have 1 half, 3 halves, and so on. And we've already seen some examples of this. So helium-4 is a boson. It has 0 net spin, uh, at least in, in the, this, uh, this configuration. And we've talked lots about electrons, which have spin half. So electron has charge, but it also has this quantum number spin. Uh, and it's, it's this fundamental quantum here. Uh, right, so this is just what I said. Leptons and gauge bosons can't be further broken out, but these hadrons can. Okay, so, so this looks like a bit of a zoo, and people have probably seen pictures like this before. This is a bubble cha chamber picture. This is kind of the uh, historically how particle physics experiments were done. So you accelerate things up in a, in a particle accelerator, let's say two particles, and you crash them together. It's kind of the most fun experiment you can imagine doing, right? You accelerate particles up at some fraction of the speed of light, and you just bang them into each other, and then you say, what happens? Well, obviously, lots of stuff. So this, all these traces in here, so this is some material that basically can be printed upon when some charged particle or something goes through it. And so you smuck these things together at high energies, and this is the result. You see all this stuff. And then after the fact, you actually have to go and look at this thing and say, well, what the heck happened? What are all these traces? And the reason why you know, we have these spirals and everything is because of magnetic and electric fields, um, things that we'll, we learn about in this class. Um, so basically, so Murray Gellman and, and George Zweig were, were kind of fundamentally involved in, in, uh, in uh, basically this SU3 description of saying that these particles, the hadrons, were not fundamental particles, but instead were made up of smaller particles. And, the only, and basically that was the only way that this kind of particle zoo could be understood. Right? So if we imagine that protons were just solid particles and they scatter off each other and other things didn't come out, this so-called particle zoo just couldn't be understood. And so the, the, uh, this, you'll see lots of weird looking things like this, SU3. So this is a, a, a symmetry group. So I've, I've harped long uh, about how physics is basically made up of, of different symmetries. Uh, and so we say that there's some flavor symmetry uh, involved here. So I'll, I'll talk about more about that a little bit later. Uh, but the proposal of these guys was that indeed these hadrons were made up of, of quarks. Um, and at the time, they predicted three quarks, the up quark, the down quark, and the strange quark. Um, and essentially, all quarks were predicted to exist before they were found. So this is definitely a case where theory is leading experiment. That's not always the case. Sometimes experimentalists win in terms of they say, look, we found this thing. What is it? They call up the theorist, and the theorist works hard and figures out what it is. And sometimes theorists are in their office, and they say, oh, there should be you know, three quarks. They call up an experimentalist that they need you know, tens of billions of dollars from Congress to build a superconducting super collider, and then 10 years later, they find it. So I think that's really how you know, advances in physics are stagnant that way. Um, Miguel Lamb got the Nobel Prize in 1968 for this. Okay, so where does this term come from? Well, there's kind of lots of, lots of arguments about, about that. Um, but basically, there's some apparently some, some uh, bit of prose in, in James Joyce Finnegan Wake, 
uh, where he uses this term quark. And so at first, I guess Gelman wasn't sure whether to call it a quark with KW or quark, but eventually um, it became so because of this. And, and so I think there's some historical interest there of where this name comes from. If you discover something as fundamental as the constituents of matter, uh, you have a lot of freedom from your colleagues to name it whatever the heck you want. And you, call it, you know, we could have called them little Gelmans or something. Uh, but anyway, so, so Melissa, so as I said, there's all these quarks. Uh, the, originally, they thought there was three. It turns out there's many. The final quark, which is known as the top quark, because it's heavy, right? The heavier these particles are, the more energy we need to smash things together in to make them spin out or fly out. Um, and so Melissa Franklin was involved uh, in the prediction of the top quark. Um, she's a, a, a particle theorist at Harvard. Actually, interesting uh, thing, Melissa Franklin was actually the first woman to get tenure um, in the physics department at Harvard University. So that's quite a, um, a, a huge accomplishment at, at, at the time, I guess. And uh, Melissa is, is a really awesome person. She's, uh, she's a cool lady. Um, anyway, so, so lots of, so basically all of these people, theorists, experimentalists, put all this information together, came from theory and these big experiments. And so this is really the standard model right here. So basically currently 17 fundamental particles. So we have six quarks, up, charm, top, down, strange, bottom. Um, then we have leptons, which are indivisible, uh, electrons, muons, the tau particle, um, and then three flavors of neutrinos. And then here are the gauge bosons that I've mentioned a few times. So gluons are going to be very important for, basically this is what mediates the strong force. Right? I, I say that whenever you have a force, there's some gauge boson that mediates that force. So we've seen that the photon is the gauge boson that mediates the electromagnetic force. The gluon is the strong force that basically keeps a proton together. Um, and then we have the uh, Z and, and W boson, which are related to the weak force. So these are very heavy, and, and the forces are very weak. And then there's this Higgs boson. So basically, everything here was accounted for, um, but there is this, you know, what the heck's going on up here? So there is basically one particle um, that, that was predicted to exist to solve a problem that I'll describe in a second um, that was only discovered very recently. And so you see that these quarks always come in these different colors. So this is this SU3 flavor symmetry I was talking about. So you can imagine that there's another quantum number, which we kind of arbitrarily call color. Um, so each quark can come in three colors, red, green, or blue. And so here's a proton, which is two up quarks and a down quark. And the only thing, so this color, it's not real physical color, right? It's basically there's, um, there's three types, and so we ascribe some, some name to those different types. They could have been called quark one, quark two, and quark three, but red, green, and blue is, is a little bit more fun, especially because any hadron like this needs to have a blue, a red, and a green, right? And a red, green, and blue make white if we have all three of them. And so that was really the, the, uh, the origin of this terminology. So this is a proton, right, that's inside an atom, and inside that proton, there's three different types of quarks. You have these different colors or the different types of quarks. Just like we can have a spin up or a spin down quantum number, we can have a red quark or a blue quark. And then these little um, spring looking things inside are, are meant to represent gluons. And so this is really why the strong force is so interesting and also so strong, is these things really do act like springs. Right? So the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force, we know it gets weaker, like 1 over r squared. So if we take two particles further apart, the force decays, it gets less strong. But for the case of a spring, right, if we have two particles on a spring, we know if they get further apart, then the force actually increases. Right? So that's a very fundamentally different type of force. And that's why, these things, that's why the strong force is so strong at very short scales. Basically, these things are really, really tightly bound together by these gluons going back and forth through the atom. Okay, so, so there's these six different types of course, quarks, and I think this, I, I stole this off Wikipedia. Uh, this is a really nice visualization of, of how the quarks have such different masses. So this little red dot, so this, this, the size of these spheres is supposed to represent how heavy these different particles are in the standard model. So this tiny little dot right here is an electron. This one is a, is a proton, and then these are all the quarks. So bottom, up, down, charm, strange. And so you can see why the, uh, the up, down, and, uh, and bottom were the first predicted and found. So these are, are uh, have small mass, right? So small mass means energy, think E equals mc squared. So the heavier something is, the Higgs being the heaviest, um, the heavier something is, basically the, the faster you have to ram things together to, to be able to observe it. And so that's why the top, which is this gigantic one, wasn't discovered until 1995. But it's pretty shocking, right? This is 
what, a, what an exciting time to, to be around and be studying physics when there's fundamental particles that were not known but were predicted a while ago and now we're actually discovering them all. So that's, that's, that's pretty cool as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so this is the theory behind quarks and gluons. This is called quantum chromodynamics. Um, this is kind of a joke, right? The chromo comes from the three colors. Uh, this looks very complicated. Um, these are the, the Feynman diagrams describing different quark processes. And I throw this up not to, uh, um, you know, just, just to basically say that it looks complicated. It's not so different than the Lagrangian that we would write down for electromagnetism that we're learning about right now. Basically, we have these different, uh, these different indices correspond to things like these different flavors, right? Red, green, um, and blue. And also, this graph right here is to show you that, so experiments are the blue lines, and this red line is theory. This is for some process, one of these, I believe. Um, and so we can really, really predict well. We understand through this theory, quantum chromodynamics. So think of this, you know, what is this theory? It's the same thing as like Maxwell's equations, right? This is the, the description of how quarks interact with each other, and we understand it very well, and this is the kind of thing you learn about in maybe an upper year um, particle physics class or a, uh, a um, pan-energy theory type class. So anyways, this is, this is the description of, of this quantum thermodynamics. Uh, okay, so where does the Higgs fit into all of this? Well, as I said, I always harp on symmetry. So the point is, you know, we're, we're sitting down in, in an office with a pen and paper, and we're trying to understand what are the fundamental particles in, in the universe, right? What's the standard model? And so we're basically starting with not much, except some observations that our experimental colleagues have given us. So we need to start with what we have, and one of the things we have is an understanding of how things should work on kind of a global sense. So the, the, that's really what underlies this notion of symmetry is that, you know, one of the, the uh, so let's say I have a system that has translational invariance. So essentially I know that if I look at the system over here, the physics is the same as if it was over here. So that now becomes a fundamental property that any theory I write down that describes the interaction of particles must satisfy that symmetry, right? And so we start with what we know, the easiest things that we know, and then we build up from there. And so it was very unsatisfying back in, in the 60s, essentially, that um, certain models of, of the electroweak interaction, so this is between, uh, between neutrinos, for example, um, it didn't have a symmetry. So the, the model that seemed to work, for the most part, didn't have a symmetry that physicists thought it should obey. And that symmetry is something called gauge invariance. I don't want to go into too much detail, but we've actually already seen a manifestation of gauge invariance in this class. And that's the fact that the electric field is just the gradient of the scalar potential. Right? And so we learned that if I add a constant to the, electric, to the electric potential, that doesn't change the electric field. So this is a symmetry in the sense that I change something up here, but nothing changes in the electric field. So this is somehow a manifestation of, of this gauge invariance that wasn't present. So what does this mean? It means that if I raise the electrostatic potential of the universe by 10 volts, the electric fields don't change anywhere. Right? So that's a symmetry of, of the universe, and that just wasn't wasn't present, something akin to this, this wasn't around at the time in the current models. Um, so electromagnetism, we know, satisfies this gauge invariance. And so it basically, the weak nuclear force did not at the time. Um, and so this was considered to be a big problem. And actually, so people have heard, you know, Higgs, you get your name attached to something. But actually, there's a, a condensed matter theorist, Phil Anderson, who's at Princeton, that somehow solved this problem in a, in a different light. And then Higgs kind of put it together with what people knew in, in particle physics. Um, so this idea was that you can break a symmetry without actually disturbing the gauge invariance. And so this picture is supposed to indicate that. So here I have a potential, just like a 5-4 potential or something like that. Um, and right now it's fully symmetric. So this ball sits at the bottom. It doesn't care if I can rotate the ball, right? It doesn't matter where it is and everything looks the same. But as soon as I put a dip, in one of these sides of the potential, then there's no reason why the ball should roll down to the right or roll to the left. Right? So imagine I have a boulder at the top of a perfectly symmetric hill, and I let it go. So it's going to break the symmetry. The symmetry is which way it rolls down. Right? At the top, it doesn't care. It can rotate around. There's no special direction down the hill, but it will roll down the hill in one direction. And that's the broken symmetry. So that's what this is supposed to see. And so you can still have this gauge invariance. So now I imagine taking this potential and I rotate it in the other direction. And so it looks like the bottom of a wine barrel, sometime, or sorry, a wine bottle. Some people call this a sombrero or a Mexican hat potential. So the point is that I've broken the symmetry, so now it's fallen down away from the origin. <laughs> But if this thing is rotated in and out of the board, then this particle or this, this thing right here can basically be at any point along it. So it still has this U1 gauge invariance. 
So this is this is this, this Anderson Dick mechanism uh, in you know one minute. Uh, okay, so so basically this this idea this picture can be put into into theory, and it's that theory that leads to the Higgs field and the excitations, the quantized excitations of the Higgs field are the Higgs particle or the Higgs boson. Um, and so basically, once that was understood, that mechanism, then everyone got very excited because now you could basically figure out how to make a Higgs. Right, this quantized excitation of the Higgs field. And this Higgs is really what gives particles mass. And so the way to think about that, there's many kind of hand-waving ways to think about it, but one way is that there's this field that permeates all space, and it basically exhibits through interactions a type of drag on all other particles, and that drag is like mass. Right, so you know, I, I can correlate momentum with mass. If I increase the mass, I get more momentum. So I have this field that's interacting, and it's like a drag. So the more drag, the stronger the interaction with the Higgs field, the more mass something has. And so that's a way to predict how much mass a given fundamental particle has. So now we have all these, these uh, exciting ways to produce the Higgs. Um, but if you look at you know, how heavy it is, it's really, really heavy. Heavy on the scale of um, giga electron, giga electron volts. And so this is basically why it took so long. People had to figure out how do we build a particle accelerator that's so powerful that we can actually get the energies high enough to observe this Higgs. And that's what happened with the, uh, the ATLAS and the CMS experiment. I think this is CMS, this is ATLAS at CERN. Um, and so this is an amazing coordination of thousands, tens of thousands almost, of, of physicists. And these two experiments, were, which were both basically looking at different ways to produce a Higgs. Is there a question? Yeah, what was electron volts measure of? So it's a measure of energy, but also mass through E equals mc squared, if I set c to be the speed of light to be 1. Yeah, so you should think of this as just, this is a many, many joules. It's, so the more energy, the more mass through E equals mc squared. Uh, so these two huge groups, they didn't want to basically bias each other's results. So these are two gigantic experiments that were happening, looking at different aspects of ways to produce the Higgs. And they didn't talk. They like they weren't allowed to talk at all because they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want some grad student running over from Atlas to CMS and saying, "Guess what we found? We found it in this regime," and then it would maybe bias the results. So they worked completely independently, looked at two completely different ways of producing the Higgs, and this is basically what they found. So this little bump right here, I drew it on the board before, at right this predicted value of about 130 uh, GeV, is evidence that they they were able to excite the Higgs field. Um, and this is exactly the mass that it has. So if there wasn't a Higgs, this is one sigma and two sigma, you would basically expect this green line from theory, and theories that include the Higgs in the standard model would produce this red line right here, and so indeed the data points, which are the black ones, fall more or less right on this line. And so this is pretty exciting, um, and, and Nobel Prize was given out for it in, in 2013. Okay, so that's all I have about this, but I can answer any questions before we move on to Dave's demos. No questions. Yeah. So what was like the the defining like leap and shot how they got it? What, what was that like pretty clear or something? Like that? I remember like it being huge. Yeah, so they had a big press conference, uh, which is which is actually has a funny story because so Fabiola Giannata, I think, is the was the head of the, the collaboration. Um, and she gave some famous talk showing this bump. Um, and the font that she used to announce it was Comic Sans, and someone said, you know, this costs like how many billion dollars and you're using Comic Sans to announce the most important particle physics discovery. Um, but basically it was, they, they've been making these measurements for many years, so these things take years and years to do the measurements, and then you have to process the data. So they produce terabytes of data, you need supercomputers. So science kind of moves at a glacial pace sometimes. Um, and so basically they'd done the experiments, they were analyzing all the data, and then they all got together and they, they uh, submitted two papers for publication um, from these two, the CMS and the Atlas experiments. Um, those were under peer review, and then basically at that point they had a big press conference and they said, you know, all the other scientists have looked at this data uh, outside of the, uh, these experiments and have decided that, that indeed this bump um, is a real bump and it's not just some artifact, right? I mean, what you don't want to have happen is someone going up an elevator at the exact time that you're doing this experiment and you get a bump or something like that. So you need to you know, make sure that nothing happens uh, and that indeed the theory which predicts this is, is what you're observing. Other questions? And there's a great documentary on uh, that's on Netflix called Particle Fever um, that basically talks about all of this. So if you're bored and um, cold this weekend when there's a wind chill advisory, you could, uh, you could watch that. It's pretty cool. Yep. 
Would you say like the hot the hot for this particle is similar to when they were creating a uh, periodic table? They knew where certain elements and weights were supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a great way to think about it. So so here it was more, you know, it, it took more money to find it, but they knew where it should be, and it was just about finding it there, essentially, and it was very, very rare. And you know, this happened in Europe, although it was an international collaboration, but this would have happened in the US in Texas. So there's a huge particle collider, the superconducting super collider. Has everyone heard about this before? So this was going to be the thing to find the Higgs. Um, now they grow mushrooms in it because uh, Congress basically decided that they didn't want to fund it. So you know, this is definitely a place where science funding in the U.S. failed. Um, so as you know, future scientists and future taxpayers, you know, we want to fund science because then we can say that this this was found here and we can stay at the cutting edge of all this stuff. Um, all right, that's my uh, political aside there.